Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am the Top Hat Gaming Man, and slowly on this channel, I am taking an in-depth look at every gaming system ever made. Recently on here, we took a 40-minute in-depth, super detailed look at the Nintendo 64's history. So going on from there, it was obviously only a matter of time before I gave the GameCube the same sort of treatment. In these sort of videos, I look at the system's history, their games, their popularity, but equally as important, I like to talk about how I experience these platforms myself. So sit back, relax, and get ready to indulge in a bit of GameCube video greatness. Yeah. I suppose the best way to start all of this off is to look at what was going on prior to the launch of the GameCube. We all had recently experienced the Nintendo 64 era, which in 2018 seems to be kind of polarising these days as to how people view the period. Personally, from my point of view, the early Nintendo 64's games were extremely fun and more technically impressive than anything I had ever seen. Playing Mario 64 for the first time was probably the biggest wow moment in my entire gaming history, and I have never really experienced any leap that impressive even to this very day. But the Nintendo 64 was gimped somewhat in the fact that there were so few games released for the system overall. Whilst I always enjoyed the Nintendo 64, right through its lifespan, I found myself needing to buy a Sony PlayStation to go alongside it, as there was simply never enough choice on the Nintendo 64 to ever have that as the only games console in a household. The library was just too small and basic to keep me entertained, which was one of many reasons that the PlayStation absolutely destroyed it sales-wise. So as of 2018, looking back at the Nintendo 64, I had a lot of fun with it. However, with the system's lack of choice and ugly early 3D graphics and controls, it makes the system a little bit disappointing to go back to today. Once I had the experience of becoming a multi-platform owner, I never looked back again. Going forward, I went on to procure every major console during their life cycles, right up until this very day. From the Sega Dreamcast to the Nintendo Switch, I have experienced every single bloody one of them in their primes. So I have plenty of systems to compare and contrast over the last 20 years. So you certainly will not be hearing any fanboying from me on this channel. Now to talk about the history behind the GameCube. As you'll recall from my last video, which was about the Nintendo 64, Nintendo had worked very closely with a company called SGI. In 1998, a splinter organisation called ArtX, who had 20 engineers who had all previously worked on the Nintendo 64's architecture whilst with SGI, joined with Nintendo once more to begin working on the design of the system logic and graphics processor for Nintendo's entry into the sixth generation of consoles. The codename at the time was Project Dolphin and was announced in May of 1999. Shortly after this, Nintendo began providing game development kits for developers and also teamed up with a computer company, IBM, to create the CPU for the system. By April 2000, ArtX had been taken over by ATI, just as their part of the hardware design had been completed. After the hostile takeover had been completed, a spokesperson is alleged to have said, ATI now becomes a major supplier to the games console market via Nintendo. The Dolphin platform is reputed to be the king of the hill in terms of graphics and video performance with 128-bit architecture. Basically, they were trying to take credit for the work done by the company that had taken over and had not actually developed anything themselves yet. In August 2000, Nintendo formally announced the console as being the GameCube. In Japan, it received the abbreviation NGC, which makes sense. In America, however, it was abbreviated to the GCN, which I guess must mean GameCube Nintendo. Stupid bloody dyslexic Americans. At E3 2001, Nintendo confirmed the 15 launch titles to be released on the GameCube. These included several titles which were only going to be released in America, because as we all know, people believe Nintendo hype possibly more in America than anywhere else. 
These games included All-Star Baseball 2002, Batman Vengeance Crazy Taxi, Dave Mira Freestyle BMX2, Disney's Tarzan Untamed, Luigi's Mansion, Madden NFL 2002, NHL Hit 2002, Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader, Super Monkey Ball, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3, and finally, Wave Race Blue Storm. Fun fact though, although all of these were all announced as launch titles, several of these weren't ready for the launch in the end. Also, this was the first console where a Mario title was not amongst the launch lineup, which was mental come to think of it. At this event, Nintendo started trying to use catchy, uh, well, catchphrases in an attempt to stand out from the crowd. The hope was to come across as more of an entertainment company as opposed to the competition. Slogans such as the Nintendo difference, born to play and weird adverts with some whispering GameCube at the end were created to make your skin crawl into wanting to buy a GameCube just to make it stop. I bloody hate the cheesy marketing from this period in time, it's the worst. Amongst all of the hype and rumours surrounding the GameCube, it was leaked that Nintendo were looking into motion controls. This was deeply concerning to the Vice President of Sega of America, who is quoted to have said, What does worry me is Dolphin's sensory controllers, which are rumoured to include microphones and headphone jacks, because there's an example of someone thinking about something different. What he didn't realise was that the GameCube wasn't going to include these features, and this was being worked on on the background for the Wiimote. Now, during the whole time period, the N64 was still on the market, and would remain so until its retirement in 2003. However, in the years leading up to the release of the GameCube, Nintendo shifted their resources over to the GBA, the successor to the Game Boy. They wanted to get this release approximately six months prior to the GameCube, so they would be able to shift the focus onto the compatibility between the two platforms, which they hoped was going to secure their position in both the handheld market and the console market simultaneously. As a result of this, several games which were being developed for the N64 were held back and instead upscaled into early release GameCube games instead. This means the last first party game which Nintendo released for the Nintendo 64 was one month prior to the formal release of the Game Boy Advance and roughly six months before the GameCube. Some of the games which were intended to be played using both the GBA and the GameCube include Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles and The Legend of Zelda Four Swords Adventure, this game being intended for up to four players. Nintendo were finally ready to unleash the GameCube into the market with, as usual, Japan being favoured to receive the console first. The Japanese market received it on the 14th of September 2001. Half a million units were shipped out to stores across Japan, but according to unofficial reports, they only managed to sell between 280 and 300,000 units in the first three days. You need to bear in mind that Nintendo had announced they had sold 650,000 GBA units just on their first day. Now, if you look at the PlayStation 2, they managed to sell 900,000 units roughly during its first weekend on the market in Japan. Despite this, Nintendo were expecting around 4 million units to sell by their financial year end in the following March. Nintendo then prepared nearly three quarters of a million units which were going to make their way to America for their launch on the 18th of November 2001. The Nintendo GameCube itself was released in North America and Japan in 2001, then in Europe and Australia in 2002 as the obvious replacement system for the Nintendo 64 as we've already said. In terms of competition, by this point in history we had already witnessed the rise and fall of the Sega Dreamcast and the rise to power of the PlayStation 2, which insanely was even more popular than the first incarnation of the PlayStation, which too conquered its generation. The GameCube also went on to compete with the Microsoft Xbox, which would see a release of its own shortly after. In this console war, Nintendo were looking to correct some of the mistakes they had made in the previous generation. So gone was the dated cartridge technology, which held them back so much, and in were discs. The GameCube was Nintendo's first foray into the world of discs, however sadly, once again, Nintendo made somewhat of a misstep regarding their storage media fall. Ridiculously, Nintendo's GameCube optical discs were half the size of regular DVDs. 
So not only did this limit the size of the games, which could be published on the GameCube once again, but this actually also meant that unlike the PS2, it was not going to be possible to use the GameCube as a DVD or CD player, which was a massive missed opportunity back then. The DVD player capabilities on the PS2 was one of the system's biggest selling points. This mental decision was executed for exactly the same reasons as the conservative company had stuck with cartridges the previous generation. Basically, Nintendo was so concerned with people potentially playing pirate games on their systems that they once again cut off their own nose to spite their face, just to stop an extremely small minority from committing piracy. So essentially, Nintendo's greed once again led the company to offering the world an inferior form of storage media. Like the Sega Dreamcast before it, the Nintendo GameCube did however support online play. However, very few people ever actually used it, as it was only compatible with a really small selection of games. The GameCube only had 8 games with internet or local area network support. Nintendo never commissioned any servers or internet services to interface with the console, but allowed other publishers to do so, and made them responsible for managing the online experiences for their games. Due to all of this, the GameCube was not in the league of the Dreamcast before it in terms of online functionality, and was nothing in comparison to the original Xbox, which came shortly after. Xbox Live Online was a massive success, however company leaders, including Shigeru Miyamoto and Satara Iwata, scoffed at the idea of online gaming, and based their stance on concerns with maintaining quality control over their games, and doubted that players would ever be willing to pay online subscription fees. With the PS2 dominating by the time the GameCube was released, I of course already owned a PlayStation 2. From a personal standpoint, I found my PS2 experience thus far a little bit of a letdown. I never really could get my head around why it was so popular at the time. Apart from the ability to play DVDs, the platform felt like a bit of a step down from the Dreamcast previously. I had not seen any beautiful games on the platform, like the likes of Shenmue, and the majority of the games I had played were generally a bit grey, ugly looking and uninspiring. The early PS2 days were a rather depressing period to be a gamer I think. The only game I remember playing over the period that impressed me whatsoever was Grand Theft Auto 3, but even that looked horrendous in comparison to what I'd been experiencing on the Dreamcast. In America, the GameCube was released and was priced at $199, which was $100 cheaper than the PS2 and the original Xbox. The GameCube performed somewhat better in the US, however by shipping close to 600,000 units within the first couple of weeks, with many stores selling out during the launch weekend and drumming up close to $100 million worth of sales, it actually managed to sell faster than the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox in that country. As I've stated on this channel many times, Americans hold Nintendo on a higher pedestal perhaps more than any other nation in the world. Over here in sunny England and the rest of Europe, Nintendo announced it was cutting the price of the GameCube over a week prior to the release on the 3rd of May 2002, as they knew they normally have troubles in this region. It was supposed to be marketed at £150, but the price was reduced to £129, or €199 Euros at the time, when the conversion rate was actually amazing. The reason for this was because one week prior, Microsoft announced they were dropping the price of the Xbox by £100 down to £199, literally only after being on the market for a few weeks. In addition to this, Microsoft were also reimbursing players who paid the original £299, with a thank you package worth about £110 to make up for them paying over the odds for the console. They must have been very worried about the GameCube indeed. So, with the release of the GameCube, I was somewhat excited I suppose. The system was dirt cheap on release in comparison to the PS2 before it, and the system was technically more powerful than both the PS2 and the Dreamcast. The PS2 to me greatly felt like something was missing from gaming at the time, and I was hoping the GameCube would bring back bright, colourful fun back to my television. I procured a GameCube on the UK launch day with copies of Bloody Raw, Virtual Striker 2002 and Luigi's Mansion. I met the GameCube for the first time one night after a day's work in secondary school. 
I had previously been following the whole pre-release hype train, but didn't know what to expect really. Gone were the days of expecting Nintendo to put out the best product on the market, with no Zelda, Mario or Mario Kart game going straight to it. This wasn't like any Nintendo Day 1 I'd experienced previously. I had heard a lot about Luigi's Mansion via watching television and reading magazines. I remember the review scores at the time being fairly lacklustre for the title. If you check on Metacritic, the game was only given 78% which is very low for a Nintendo game, considering the dullest of game entries seem to automatically get given 90% plus most of the time anyway. So I guess I was kind of expecting the worst with Luigi's Mansion, but upon playing it, it was pleasantly surprising. The game was extremely unique, atmospheric and unlike anything I'd played before it. Graphically, the game was beautiful too, and looked far superior to anything I owned on my PlayStation 2. Further to this, I remember it feeling great to be playing as Luigi in a game, especially after his lack of an appearance in Mario 64. We all needed a little bit more Luigi in our life at the time. I suppose a bit like how we need some more Waluigi in our lives now. The vacuum cleaner mechanic in the game was bloody hilarious, and a great callback to Ghostbusters, which was another franchise I absolutely adored in my youth. In relation to all of this, I remember reading an article about the game on release, and there was a section in it that prophesied that Professor Egad would be a Nintendo icon in years to come. Which is very amusing to be fair, as you do appear to have all of these weird 20 year old something hipsters these days, who like to lie to the world and claim that GameCube is the best system of all time. What a load of twats. So all in all, I was extremely impressed with Luigi's Mansion and so were a lot of other people, as the game remains a household name and favourite right up until this very day, proving that professional game reviewers do not necessarily have the best methods when it comes to grading their games. I suppose my initial impressions of the GameCube were fairly good. I even liked the tacky purple Fisher Price look the system had at the time, and the system didn't look like it was trying to be cool like everything else had been trying to do for the previous decade. The system stood out, was compact and looked different. The system's impractical, stupid little discs even felt new and futuristic in a way, and the four controller ports looked to see a renaissance for the Nintendo 64's multiplayer experiences. Things were looking quite interesting. The controller was one of the comfiest I had ever held, and certainly was a step up in my opinion from the Nintendo 64, PlayStation and Dreamcast controllers, although I suppose the PS2's dual analog sticks proved more practical as we moved into the future. I really really wanted to see the GameCube do well, as I was dreaming of a Nintendo return to form, like that of the Super Nintendo days. So before we move on, let's talk about more of my other early GameCube gaming experiences. One memory that sticks out to me was the release of Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. Sure this was a port, but to see Sonic the Hedgehog on a Nintendo console was insane. It was as mental as seeing Vince McMahon appear on Monday Nitro for the first time. These were events which just seemed too ridiculous to even comprehend as a 90s kid. The idea of having a Nintendo console that also had the potential to have loads of Sega games on it made me salivate at the time. Personally, I had skipped Sonic Adventure 2 on the Dreamcast previously, as I was not a big fan of the first game in the series. However, the novelty of playing it on a Nintendo system was enough ammunition to make me want to give it a try once again, and I have to say, I was pleasantly surprised again. This game was much better than its predecessor and a worthy entry to the GameCube's overall library. On the subject of Sonic, I also procured Sonic Mega Collection. This was fantastic too, as I had bypassed the Mega Drive as a child, and only really got to experience any of the games from this collection around friends' houses. This was a few months prior to becoming a retro game collector, and I suppose the fun I had with this massive collection of games may have influenced me into purchasing my first ever Mega Drive just a few months after. Again, playing Mega Drive games on a Nintendo console was just such a surreal experience, and also a welcome change considering how much of a rampage console gaming was in terms of trying to remove any remnants of the 2D era. The GameCube overall saw quite a lot of decent Sega entries on the platform, some of which we will go into in more detail later. But now I guess it's time to talk about some of the games which are more synonymous with the GameCube. 
Mario Kart Double Dash was a game I was extremely excited for. I had loved all three previous Mario Kart games with a passion, and all of the entries stood out and brought a lot of new fun and features to the franchise. Whilst graphically, Double Dash looked very nice, this was thus far my least inspiring experience out of the four Mario Kart games. Super Mario Kart introduced me to the franchise, Mario Kart 64 blew me away with its 3D graphics and multiplayer, and Super Circuit wowed me for the outrageous amount of tracks the game featured and its steep difficulty it had when it came to winning everything. Double Dash on the other hand seemed very easy and dumped down in comparison to the previous three games. I remember winning everything in the game extremely quickly and running out of stuff to do extremely fast. Mario Kart 64 took me ages to master and I had not won everything in either Super Mario Kart or Super Circuit to this very day. Double Dash just felt very childish and hand-holdy in comparison to what Mario Kart games had offered to me previously. It felt like a game that would be more likely to please first timers to the franchise rather than seasoned veterans like myself. Whilst on the subject of Mario, I guess it's time to talk about Bloody Mario Sunshine, one of the games I perhaps anticipated more than any other game in history. Mario 64 blew my socks off, so I was fully hoping for Sunshine to come along and do the exact same thing. However, sadly, I was very disappointed. Aesthetically, once again, Mario Sunshine, like many GameCube games, was very pretty and graphically didn't look a whole lot different to games you find on the Nintendo Switch today. However, in terms of the gameplay, I have to say I was vastly disappointed with this one. The flood mechanic just had me constantly wishing we had a proper Mario 64 2 instead, especially on the level subsections where you got to play without wearing the bloody thing on your back. It felt like Flood was added to the game to add innovation for the sake of innovation, in typical Nintendo fashion. Which is kind of odd in a way, considering how the GameCube is probably Nintendo's most traditional style console they have ever produced. To this day, I have never bothered to collect every Shine Sprite, despite making an effort to find every collectible in Mario 64, 3D World, 3D Land, Galaxy 1 and 2. The game is my least favourite 3D Mario game, and the level design just does not seem as well laid out as it does in other entries in the series. With games like Mario Sunshine, I was now starting to fear for the future of the Nintendo product overall. So, Mario and Mario Kart hadn't wowed me on the GameCube, like they had done previously on the Nintendo 64. But surely Star Fox could write? Lilac Wars was one of the best games on the entire 64 platform, and still holds up better than most games to this very day. Star Fox Adventure on the other hand just annoyed the crap out of me. I was creeped out by the furry characters in this game, before I even knew the word existed, and the gameplay was lacklustre at the best of times, with most of the gameplay in like a Tesco value ocarina of time. This just was simply not what I wanted from a Star Fox game. It was just so freaking bizarre. The best bits in the game were the short sections where you got to fly your R-Wing, but these segments were so short it just felt like a tease and made you pine for the days of old. An absolutely horrible game when compared to Lilac Wars. It was an average game though if you try and judge it on its own merits I suppose at the very least. This was also the last game produced by British developers Rare before they were purchased by Microsoft, another indicator that pointed out that Nintendo seemed to be losing its edge a little bit. Whilst all of this was going on, I was witnessing a Nintendo decline in my country like I had never seen before. Certain high street stores like Curry's and Dixon's where I had always purchased my games from previously made the move to stop selling GameCube games in their stores altogether. The shell started featuring only PlayStation 2 and Xbox games, and I was starting to fear that down the line I was going to lose my colourful mascotty favourites altogether. To me, it was feeling like a very dark time to be a Nintendo fan. I was starting to wonder if the GameCube would be Nintendo's last ever system, much like the Dreamcast was Sega's final shot just a couple of years earlier. In regards to Sega and Nintendo products, it felt like it was the end of an era, and we were moving into a new time in gaming. People were now GTA this and Halo that, when they should have been saying Pikmin this and WarioWare that. To steer back away from the negatives, and back to the positives, let's talk about a few GameCube games that blew me away, and raise my expectations slightly for Nintendo's future. First off, I would like to mention Pikmin. 
it was really fresh to see a completely new Nintendo intellectual property and the first significant one to be introduced since Pokemon a few years prior. I bloody loved Pikmin and the game kind of reminds me of when I used to play with ants in my garden as a child. Such a quirky unique game and I bloody loved it. Of course a few years later on the GameCube we also got Pikmin 2 as well. Unfortunately I never got round to playing this one until about a decade after it came out. However I thoroughly enjoyed the game and was every bit as impressed about it as I was with its predecessor. For me it's a toss up between Pikmin and this game, Super Smash Bros. Meal, as to which is my favourite ever GameCube game. All of the previous Nintendo 64 games to get sequels on the GameCube didn't quite deliver for me. However, I felt that Smash on the Cube was a different league altogether to its previous instalment. The game is sublime and it is really easy to see as to why so many people love this game so much and see it as the greatest Smash game of all time. This is the best selling game on the GameCube for a reason and it is due to this game as to why Smash is such a massive franchise to this very day. Super Smash Bros. Meal by far is definitely the biggest success story when it comes down to discussing the history of the GameCube. It is like what Super Mario Bros is to the NES and the Ocarina of Time is to the 64. Speaking of the Ocarina of Time, the first Zelda game to see a release on the GameCube was The Wind Waker. This reimagining of the franchise and new art style had spotty pimpled Nintendo fanboys screeching all over the internet. Re, this is not our Zelda, we want a dark grey looking edgy Zelda so the game looks exactly like most of the content that we're playing on the PS2 was the war cry and the tears from many fanboys online. I on the other hand salivated at the look of the new art style. Gone was the ugly polygons, and in place were glorious cell shaded cartoon like aesthetics. One of the many features that impressed me most about the look of this game was Link's facial expressions. This was back in the day that even in the most high budget of games, characters did not yet show any facial expressions very well. Just look at Shenmue for example, probably the most technically impressive game of that time with the largest budget ever and Ryu had for facial expressions that not even a 1980s robot would be jealous of. The emotion Link could show made this rendition of Link one of the most charming characters in gaming which I had ever seen. The game itself was okay, it didn't feel like it was anywhere close to the quality of the Ocarina of Time or Link to the Past, but it was a very decent game nonetheless. My only real gripes with it was there was not enough dungeons and there was far too much sea, however ultimately it was a lot of fun. Another four years later, after the screeching had subsided, Okay! That is it! This is the final straw! Nintendo buckled to the fanboy's pressure and released the dark edgy Zelda game fans were asking for in the form of Twilight Princess. Gameplay wise and aesthetically this is probably the closest we have come to the Ocarina of Time and I really really like this game. I do not feel the graphics were quite on par with the Wind Waker though. Imagine the Twilight Princess with Wind Waker style graphics, now that would have been a game to behold. Over the GameCube's lifetime the GameCube would go to sell 22 million units. To put this into perspective the Xbox sold 24 million but the PS2 would sell 155 million. Even the Nintendo 64 sold 33 million so it didn't even manage to beat its own predecessor. It did manage to outsell the Dreamcast though which shifted just over 9 million units. The repercussions of this would mean that Nintendo needed to cease production of the GameCube units for most of 2003 in order to be able to sell all of their surplus stock. In addition to this, in desperation they went on to drop the price again. Those large rotund Americans would now be able to buy the console for only $99. Thankfully for Nintendo, this did manage to give them a little boost, but it wouldn't ever be significant enough to make a real difference in the end. Now to talk about two franchises I have mentioned because people will re if I fail to mention them. Two series that have a big following on the GameCube are Metroid Prime games and the Resident Evil series. Now personally these are two series of games I have never really got on with so I cannot really attempt to speak highly of them nor criticise them as the games genres are simply not for me. 
I personally find horror games very juvenile, as I do not jump scare very easily. So sadly, you will never see me scream like a man-child like the likes of PewDiePie. Yuck. And frankly, for reasons I cannot really figure, Metro Prime titles do not really click with me either. But different strokes for different folks, as the old saying goes. Star Fox had a second shot at GameCube glory, this time in Star Fox Assault. Rather than Rare, this time Namco got a shot at making a game within the Star Fox franchise. While it's not a great game by any means, I feel this one is a massive step up from Star Fox Adventure and offers you a much more Star Fox-like experience than Rare's offering. Sadly, there are still a lot of on-foot levels in this game, but at least you run around with a gun rather than a freaking spear in this one. The R-Wings levels in this one are in much greater supply and are great fun too. I didn't play this game until the Wii was in existence, but I still really enjoyed it. To me, Star Fox Assault is to Lilac Wars what Return to Oz is to uh, The Wizard of Oz. Sure, it's unnecessary, and should it really exist, but it is strange and interesting nonetheless. Another favourite amongst my collection is Fire Emblem Path to Radiance. The game is like any other Fire Emblem game. It is a turn-based strategy JRPG that plays very similar to Advance Wars. This is a series I have been getting fonder and fonder of over time, and it has got to the point now where the upcoming Switch release is my most anticipated game for the system. The franchise made it to the West simply off the back of how popular Smash Bros had made some of the Fire Emblem characters, and Fire Emblem has thankfully been a mainstay in this part of the world ever since. If you want this one though, you are going to have to pay out as it is now amongst the most expensive games on the whole system. The next game to have wowed me was Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, by far the greatest game in the history of the Paper Mario franchise. This is not only the greatest Paper Mario game, but maybe one of the best JRPGs ever that could fit into any sort of best of lists. It's just your classic deep turn based JRPG, much like a Final Fantasy game I suppose, a truly wonderful experience, and one of the top must play games for the GameCube system. In fact, I may have another playthrough of this game sometime soon. It has been a while I suppose. Moving away from games again for a moment, the Nintendo GameCube also had the console add-on known as the Game Boy Player, which is probably my favourite console add-on of all time, and perhaps one of the biggest reasons as to why the GameCube system is still relevant. Considering that the Wii can also play GameCube games too, using this amazing device you can play Game Boy, Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance games all on your GameCube. A truly epic device that allowed me to play a Mother 3 translation cartridge straight onto my CRT television. Now you're playing with power. Yeah. Another cool extra I loved on the GameCube was the Wavebird controller, which is arguably the first good wireless game controller. Nintendo had attempted to create a reliable wireless controller since the development of the Famicom and constantly tried and failed. Like most wireless controllers of its era, the Wavebird relies on RF technology, first used in gaming with Atari's CX42 joysticks instead of infrared line of sight signal transmissions. The range of the Wavebird controller is officially 6 meters, but some users have reported ranges of 18 to 21 meters. The Wavebird includes a small receiver unit, which must be plugged into the controller port of the GameCube, a truly wonderful device for its time that freed us from all of those pesky wires. Good times. Also, if you are going to be talking about the GameCube, what about those ridiculous bongos? Donkey Konga was a great rhythm game that inspired successful franchises such as Guitar Hero. No games makes you look quite as ridiculous as Donkey Konga. However, due to the licensed bloody music, I cannot illustrate to you the sound of me playing with this one, which is a bit annoying. But yes, ladies and gentlemen, Donkey Konga exists, certainly. Once again, mentioning Sega on the platform, there were all sorts of Dreamcast ports on the platform I haven't touched on yet. From the original Sonic Adventure to Crazy Taxi, however my favourite port of all is Skies of Arcadia, one of the greatest JRPGs of its day. I talked about this game fairly recently in my Dreamcast video, so I will not go into any depth. However, it is worth mentioning that the GameCube version of this game is superior to the Dreamcast counterpart, due to the fact that you only have to take part in half the amount of random encounters, 
due to a boost in double the experience points. Grinding can be fun, but sometimes less is truly more. Nintendo also gave Sega permission to produce an F-Zero game for the GameCube in the form of F-Zero GX. This game is literally what it says on the tin, F bloody zero. And this game is just as amazing as its Nintendo 64 counterpart. Sadly though, this was the last console F-Zero game, which saddens me to this day. I suppose at least we got the F-Zero stage in Mario Kart 8, which is um, something, I suppose. One big franchise I have yet to mention is Pokemon. Bloody Pokemon had a presence on the GameCube in the form of Pokemon Coliseum and Pokemon Gal of Darkness XD. These games are sequels to the Pokemon Stadium series and feature some of the same elements, such as being able to use your team from the Game Boy Advance games and use them in tournaments to win trophies in those. The big selling point of this game though is that it featured a full 3D Pokemon JRPG, in both titles actually which did not get mentioned a great deal today for some reason. These were the games everyone was crying out for on the Nintendo 64, and if they had received releases in the 64 life cycle instead, then I reckon these games would probably be remembered as all-time classics. I just guess Pokemon was kind of naff during Generation 3, and it was seen as a past fad. I am glad to see Pokemania running wild once again today though. So, ladies and gentlemen, on reflection, the GameCube has a diverse library of games, and there are many other great titles I never found the time to talk about, because there's just so much content to talk about on the GameCube. From Rogue Squadron games to Mario Parties and the other Mario Sports titles, there are many games amongst the fantastic titles I never really made the time for today. So I guess it speaks volumes of the platform's library as I managed to cover most of the significant titles really easily when talking about the Nintendo 64. In regards to the GameCube's place both then and now, I think things have changed somewhat. In the system's heyday, I think what the Nintendo 64 was bringing to the table was far more impressive for its time than what the GameCube was doing a little bit later. Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, Lilac Wars and Ocarina of Time just wowed me so much more than Sunshine, Double Dash, Adventure and Wind Waker. In most cases, the Nintendo 64 had a much bigger wow factor to many of its games. However, Paper Mario and Super Smash Bros. on the GameCube did manage to impressively topple their predecessors, which was no easy feat when you consider the quality they were up against. The GameCube, I suppose, is a system with a lot of great games but with nothing really standing out about it. It is a great console, but when you compare it to other Nintendo platforms, what is really that memorable and impactful about it? This system has a handle on it, I suppose, which is um, something. The lack of USP is the reason as to why the console was never really that popular. There was no specific reason to really buy a GameCube other than you had the opportunity to play Nintendo games, and Nintendo's stock had dropped somewhat in the Nintendo 64's era, whereas PlayStation had continued to rise. Looking back, I can see why not that many people chose the GameCube. The sixth generation of gaming is probably my least favourite in gaming history, due to in most cases nearly all the big games were ugly gritty grey messes, with little in the way of colourful 2D games being around to break up this boring monotony. This was before we had a thriving indie scene coming in to fill the holes too. Gaming was a dark grey place at the time, and in some ways for me anyway, and for many others, the GameCube shined bright as a beacon of hope that one day we would get many bright, colourful, exciting games back on the home consoles again. As stated earlier, the GameCube only sold 22 million units, and Nintendo were on the console ropes. However, Nintendo are a company you can never count out, and they came back for next generation selling a ridiculous 100 million units with the Nintendo Wii. So variation survived, and stuff continued to progress nicely. So, overall, is the GameCube worth playing today? Sure, I suppose, why not? In the grand scheme of history, the system offers nothing that really stands out in terms of features. However, it features a cracking library that's always worth a play. Is the GameCube one of the greatest systems of all time? Surely not. Is it one of the greatest Nintendo platforms ever? Definitely not. Despite what the younger millennial hipsters would try and tell you with their fake news. The system is fun though, nonetheless. Even for those of us that are not avocado on toast eating deplorables. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, that was the story of the Nintendo GameCube. How I experienced it and my opinions on the platform today. 
What do you think of the system and do you agree with me about the system's importance being overly inflated by loonies in their early to mid 20s? Let me know in the comment section. Also, do not forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit the notification bell for regular content just like this. Finally, my channel, Top Act Gaming Man, is partly funded from the fantastic support and donations I receive from my lovely Patreon benefactors. So shout outs to Carl Johnson, Shizuka Kobayashi, Richard Clark, Michael Keneally, Greg Hooper, Harold Webb, Synth Spaces, Kevin Fahili, David Mountford, Andrew Bazansky, Edward O'Reilly, Pizza Dawn, Retail Archaeology, Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, and all of my other patrons. I would really struggle to make these videos without all of your kindness. If you too would like to support this fine channel, then make sure you check out my Patreon page. Yeah, cheerio!